is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the third Monday of the month, which means it's time for Healing Spices with Dr. Sunil Pai. This is part 11. And the spices we're going to discuss today for your healing are sage, sesame seed, star anise, and my favorite, sun-dried tomato. Please welcome Dr. Pai back. Thank Hello. you very much. It's great to be back. We've been off a little bit. So good to join back in the series and start off where we left off last time. Absolutely. Because you are, you're very popular with, I mean, there's, you have your groupies, Dr. Richard Hubbard, for example, he, like you're his favorite of all 28 guests. So. Well, I just did a podcast for him. I actually did two podcasts for him. Oh, it was great. Nice. He, has a, he has a healthy in Connecticut or something like that thing. So I did a, a wonderful show answering a lot of, he had a lot of questions and stuff. And uh, we took off on some of the spices, by the way, he had some, he wanted a deep dive. And uh, anyway, so it's nice because one of the things that since we're talking about it, we might as well talk about it. We, you know, I talked about saffron, I think that one of the last ones and he got really interested in saffron so i gave him a couple of websites one that's here in the united states one that that we can get overseas and then just this week um the studies came out with you know consumer labs or one of those companies showing that you know all of the saffron supplements did not have any saffron in there oh yeah of course <laughs> we expected that because you know we were talking about how expensive it is and how you know even the spice itself is adulterated most of the time and we went through all the differences and but then you know can you imagine then someone buying a supplement which is like even a, a more you know, adulterated or worse kind of industry because you, no one's going to really put that price of that ingredient in there to get the clinical results at this such a low price. And so it was funny because I like you can have a better chance of using the real spice and paying the money and getting the physical uh, health benefits rather than just um, buying a supplement for that. So anyways. Why is saffron is the most expensive spice in the world, I believe, followed by the vanilla bean. But why is it so expensive? Is it because it's, it's not enough grown or is it? the? No, it's because you have to handpick each little crocus of the flower. Every little stamen has to be handpicked by a woman. Oh. They do this in fields at 4 a.m. when the when the flowers bloom. And, you know, on the, if the people go back to our last one, I show all the, the videos and like what part of plant and everything else like that. Um, but the, 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 the challenge is it, it's like 70,000 flowers to get like a pound. That's, That's a lot of labor. Right. And so these women have to pick each one. You know, they, it's just like a farming, but it's a lot. It's, it's labor intensive. So you can't just it's not the problem is not growing more. It's that it, it, you know, only, only one person can pick so many things at a time. And they, you know, they take the two best ones or three best ones and they keep it there for the use and usually in the region which would be middle east and you know iran and places that have like the best fields for that some parts in india some parts in spain uh and then the rest of it gets shipped out to everywhere else and so we kind of get the the lower versions of that but if you go back to uh, our previous um healing spices episode part 10 uh you can learn a, a lot more about uh, saffron that's interesting wow thank you yeah. Hey, you know, I noticed you were a speaker for the Real Truth About Health Summit. So was I. What did you talk about for that summit? Well, I spoke, you know, I've I've given, I think, eight lectures <laughs> for them over the last four years. And so I mean, I've talked about inflammation a couple of times, you know, from COVID to cancer, how to lower inflammation, how to avoid NSAIDs, non steroidal anti-inflammatories. I talked about microbiome you know, what it is and how to fix it, restore it and repair it. I talked about the stacking effects of inflammation and, and sensitivities and allergies and environmental. So this year I actually went to a completely different area. I went in to talk about testing. So I wanted people who don't have an integrative doctor uh, to, to understand like what they should be asking when they get conventional labs, when they talk to their doctors, like, Hey, this is what you should be asking. Cause again, in the average 12 minute visit now, or nine to nine to 16, but 12 hour, 12, 12 minutes average, then, you know, what can you get from that? You have to disclose as much as you can because the doctor doesn't have time to ask you the questions. And so the more that people understand what tests, you know, even in, from primary care aspect, what is available, then based on their symptoms, which they usually never be able to tell, you know, all the way because the history is not really given in that short period of time that they can kind of be more proactive saying, these are the things, you know, I'm having these symptoms. Maybe I need to check my full thyroid or maybe I check my, my full, you know, blood sugar testing. And, and, you know, I have a cholesterol problem. Then can I learn about my particle size or density or am I a super producer or super absorber? And then we go into like the sensitivity testings of like what, what foods trigger inflammation, you know, what, what kind of how, you know, how, what does a microbiome test show? And people have any kind of GI, IBS, you know, you know, reflux, heartburn, diarrhea, constipation. Like, what are the things that we should be looking for aside of just doing a colonoscopy and endoscopy? 
and those kind of things, you know, even with cancer patients, what can we do for screening cancer patients? Aside of, you know, the mammograms and the, and the you know, colonoscopies and, and, and x-rays and some of the blood work, there's further testing that can be available for those patients. And um, so, you know, that, that, that was a discussion. It was like, these are the tests that your doctor usually doesn't order or can order, but you really need to be more proactive. And it doesn't mean that everybody needs all the tests, but really, I think once people understand what is available, they can actually assist their provider on providing them better care. And of course, I'm always available. So if they, people want to do a telehealth consultation with me, then I can assist them uh, with their healthcare. That's amazing. That's how I found out about you was from yeah. that conference. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So we got some S's today. Yes. All right. So am I ready to share? You bet. All right. Let's do that. One second here. Let me go here. All right. So welcome, everybody. This is part 11 of the Healing Spices series. My name is Dr. Sunil Pai, integrative medicine specialist here for 25 years at uh, House of San Gemini Integrative Medicine Health and Lifestyle Center here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Today, we're going to talk about four uh, new spices, starting off leaving from saffron in part 10. But now we're going to talk about sage, sesame seed, star anise, and sun-dried tomatoes. So let's get started. Again, um, a lot of information I talk about in these discussions and lectures and Q&As is all about you know, coming from my book, An Inflammation Nation, the 10 definitive steps to preventing and reversing all diseases through diet, lifestyle, and natural anti-inflammatories. And a lot of the spices that we're going to talk about today is from this amazing book, which is from a colleague of mine, Dr. Agarwal's Healing Spices, which is available uh, in any place that you buy online books or bookstores. I highly recommend it because this is where I'm referencing a lot of this information. And again, the key to optimum health, as we all know, is eating a whole food plant-based diet. However, most important aspect of the plant-based diet is the herbs and spices, which actually makes the food, in my, my opinion, more flavorful. And that's how we make food more medicine, uh, by also having tastier meals and improving our health outcomes by understanding the medicinal qualities of why we actually culinary-wise put things together. So today we're going to talk about sage. Starting off with sage, sage is important for memory and mood. Now, sage um, may be helpful in preventing the following, and the data will show for Alzheimer's disease, uh, anxiety, cancer, uh, cold sores, dermatitis, um, contact dermatitis, uh, eczema, diabetes, fatigue, uh, general herpes, heart disease, memory loss, again, kind of going along with the Alzheimer's cognitive issues, psoriasis, which goes along similar with the dermatitis and eczema, sore throat, strokes, and ulcers. I love sage. It's one of those, one of the favorite things that we like to use out here in the Southwest. And um, the benefits of sage. So let's talk about that. So memory, you know, when people use sage extract, now you can cook with it, but you know, some of these studies always are using extracts because we're trying to learn about a little bit higher concentration, but it did show uh, on the test when they give the subjects a sage extract, and then they, they have them like, you know, they give them a set of lists, almost like a mini mental exam. They give them a set of lists and then you have to repeat it later on. And then they give them a set of lists and they have to repeat it later. They did it over several days. And what they found is that in the group that actually uses sage, they actually had a faster recall and a better recall of those words even several days later okay so that's pretty impressive um and also in a lot of the the subject in another study they reported themselves being more calm and having the sense of contentment uh for up to about six hours after consuming so it was almost like cutting down a little bit on anxiety so that's a nice thing that you know for most people it's like hey what if we're studying or we're trying to go into a stressful situation something like Sage can be very beneficial. When we look at heart disease, for example, we use a lot of uh, sage in Chinese medicine. Traditional Chinese medicine, uh, there's a, uh, they call it Dan Shen, uh, and that's uh, predominantly made with, with um, sage. Um, interesting thing is that helps with cardiovascular health. And so when they give Dan Shen in Chinese medicine, interesting thing, the data will show that if someone had a stroke, and they take Dan Shin afterwards, they reduce their risk of having a repeat stroke. And it's very significant. Also, there's data that it shows that it slows the buildup of arterial plaque, again, having that cardiovascular health benefit. When it comes to uh, Alzheimer's support, it does prevent age-related memory loss. 
And what they find is that, and, and what the mechanism of action is, it's blocking the enzyme cholinesterase to keep acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter in your brain, around longer. And so what happens is we, see, we tend to see that um, people have this like activity with this enzyme that is breaking down the neurotransmitter. And the more memory problems that we have, the lower the acetylcholine levels in the brain. And so for mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease, after four months, there was a significant better outcome in cognitive function. Now, it's not reversing the disease, but how simple is that? I mean, right now with Alzheimer's disease being almost an epidemic, particularly in the aging population, all neurodegenerative diseases, by the way, uh, cognitive diseases are becoming a big problem for uh, our aging population. And even some of the younger population, as we can see through the standard lifestyle diet and environmental exposures. But this is something that we can help to improve the function. And um, it's very simple, right? So four months to help starting improving the outcome. And why that's important? Because right now, from a conventional pharmaceutical standpoint, we don't have any game changes. We don't have any drugs that actually have improved the overall lifestyle and quality of life of people with uh, Alzheimer's disease. Now, other drugs might be helpful in other conditions, which were pharmacologically, wow, that's a great thing that we've discovered and and it can be a game changer. Unfortunately, although there's a lot of drugs that they give and most people who have a parent or a family member that has, uh, you know, cognitive dysfunction, uh, most of them, I have not met anybody in 25 years of practice that says, oh my God, this drug uh, help me or help my family. We just give it because that's kind of something that, you know, that is only left to give from a drug company, but the quality of life of their memory never really improves. And so this is something that we actually can see in the study uh, showing from mild to moderate disease, it actually can improve some outcome. And any improvement of the outcome of a patient that has Alzheimer's disease improves their quality of life and the caregiver's quality of life as well. There's some research showing that it's that helpful for skin and colon cancer and, and cell culture. And also when they take this age, and, and you know, a lot of um, indigenous cultures out here, particularly in New Mexico, Native American culture, we use a lot of sage as well. But um, we also can put this into topicals. And so you know, for psoriasis, eczema, contact dermatitis, the studies showed that when they make that into a topical lotion, it worked better than the overcount over-the-counter hydrocortisone, one to two percent hydrocortisone cream for clearing up any kind of irritant, um, you know, skin rashes uh, by lowering inflammation. So again, you know, everything's about lowering inflammation, lowering cardiovascular health, and um, it actually been showing uh, the sage extract to lower the virus that causes cold sores and genital herpes. So. Um, There used to be actually some products out there I remember seeing uh, in the past that was actually being marketed for uh, lowering viruses and such like that. So examples of sage, you know, most of us just think of, I always think of pasta, you know, I always think of like some kind of ravioli, butternut squash with a little sage butter. We can make it vegan. Uh, That's how I do it. Um, fried sage, you know, it's kind of interesting. You can take the sage itself and you can make it into a tempura. In fact, you can even put it in the air fryer for those people who want to use less oil. Um, a lot of people think of it like, you know, using it with pizza and pastas. Uh, I like to use it with like winter squash and, you know, sweet potatoes. It's one of, it's a wonderful thing that goes along with it. And even like when we use it with desserts, like baked apples, it's a nice complement to the, those flavors as well. It pairs a lot with a lot of things. So sage, you know, pairs with almond, basil, bay leaf, clove, garlic, marjoram, mint, onion, oregano, nutmeg, parsley, rosemary, sun-dried tomato, which we'll talk about, and thyme. Uh, And it complements, you know, like when you put it in a sauce, like I'm talking about, you know, here, vegan butters, but when you make a sauce, it's a great thing to add when you're simmering it in. It just kind of has an infusion. A lot of people use infused oils, even, you know, even if they're putting olive oil or some kind of dressing, you can infuse it uh, using the sage uh, the sage leaves, you, gravies, you know, any kind of veggie loaf, pizza, polenta. I love it on polenta. One of my favorite things again. And also you can put it into some scones. The next healing spice I'm going to talk to about number 42 is sesame seed and it's oiling your circulation. You know, sesame seed is one of the most popular oils that we use in Ayurvedic medicine in India because of its health qualities. We're not talking about just internally, we're talking about topically. In in India, we use sesame oil almost as the first and foremost topical skin oil due to the anti-inflammatory effects that it has. So in India, in Ayurvedic medicine, when we do something called panchakarma, which is when we do these body therapies of detoxification and rejuvenation and strengthening, we're always using uh, sesame seed uh, oil. Now, sesame seeds also may be shown uh, and to prevent and or treat Alzheimer's disease, cancer, cholesterol, heart disease, 
high blood pressure, Huntington's disease, which is very interesting, and it helps accelerate wound healing. And you'll see that, you know, with sesame seeds, there's hold and unhold. Um, the, the hold is going to be this, like what I have this picture here. It's not so clear, but it's usually the lighter sesame seed. It's like a light tan. And then sometimes you see a really, really darker tan uh, color of seed. And that's just the hold. That's just kind of like having a little bit of the shell. It's super, super tiny. Um, there's not really much health differences in terms of they're both healthy. I like people to get what they have available uh, for them. Uh, but the, 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 the darker tan will have a tiny little bit more fiber, a little bit more insoluble fiber just due to the shell. So that's one thing that you can always remember. Like I just use sesame seeds. Now, what you see usually on a sesame seed bun, for example, will be these lighter, uh, lighter color sesame seeds that are whole. But sometimes when you go to the store and you, you're looking, if you have the option, then go ahead and I would just kind of you know, up it and get a little bit more brown, darker, um, unhold sesame seeds. Um, also recommend people, you know, when you're also cooking aside of, you know, eating it, you can roast the sesame seeds too. Some people like to have that roasted flavor. Um, and then some people, you know, like when we use it in other things like tahino that we use it raw. Now, sesame seeds, interesting enough, has been shown to do the following helping with blood pressure. And this is pretty impressive. There was a study that people were taking a, a common calcium channel blocker, which is a form of medications that we give commonly for blood pressure. There was 350 people in the study. So it was a nice study and it was a two month trial. And all they were to do, aside of taking their blood pressure medications, which they were, and their blood pressure was you know, on a certain level, you know, under moderate control with it, is that they were to change all their oils, so olive oil, avocado oil, sunflower, safflower, whatever they were using, you know, in their household, coconut, this or that, to just to use sesame seed oil. And they did that for two months. So it wasn't like eat more or add more, just like the normal daily use in your cooking, right? And what they found was that their systolic blood pressure, that's the top number, which was averaging in the, in the 350 people, 166, dropped to 134. 30 point drop just for daily average use of adding some sesame oil and the diastolic, which is the lower number of your blood pressure was averaging 101. It dropped to 85. That's a really significant increase. I'm sorry, decrease of blood pressure just by adding a food item. Right. And we'll talk about some of the benefits. Interesting thing also is they found when they were doing their complete metabolic panel. Um, which I was talking about some of the testing that people can do that we look for kidney, liver, and electrolyte function uh, when we do like primary care or just conventional screening. Um, these patients who are consuming a little bit of this in their diet, not, not a lot, just daily, you know, when they're cooking and adding it a little bit, their sodium levels were actually lower and their potassium levels was actually higher, which is what we're always trying to look for, improving, lowering the sodium intake, right? And a lot of times people have too much sodium in their diet. And also a lot of people have low potassium. And that's why, you know, certain drugs actually uh, help, you know, lower uh, potassium level. So there's something like it was balancing some of their electrolyte function, even though it's not a, a, a sodium reducer directly, it has these wonderful benefits. It does have cancer supportive uh, actions, and uh, the researchers found that they call something. There's there's two main components in sesame that has been studied. One's called sesamin, another one's sesaminol, and they're both very helpful. And they found that the sesamin from sesame seed and sesame seed oil actually stopped the growth of breast cancer cells. It's reduced the activity of genes that are linked to lung, bone, kidney, skin, and also it actually in the cell culture killed leukemia cells. So it's interesting because as we're talking about epigenetics with our patient, diet, lifestyle, environment, and belief system, and how we can take something you know, naturally through, through mind, body, through food, through you know, our environment, and change the risk of our cancer, even if we have some of those genetics that say in our family, we might have a higher rate of having it. And so this is something we always talk about epigenetics because it is the diet, the lifestyle, environment, belief system. And we know that when we move plant-based, we can turn down and, and modify a variety of genetic factors. And the data here supports the use of sesame seed with some of those wonderful actions. When we look at antioxidant pr protection, the component of vitamin E is called tocopherols, and sesame seed is high in what they call gamma tocopherols, which is actually the better form. Like there's, there's different forms of vitamin E, and, and you'll see in supplements, they use something called alpha tocopherol, alpha tocopherols. And you also see something which is even worse, which is DL alpha tocopherols, which is like the synthetic synthetic version of it, which is not very good for us. And so if you ever see DL alpha, you don't want to take that. But if you, you want to be having gamma, tocopherols, delta 
tocopherols. These are the part of the vitamin E that have that really, really strong antioxidant protection that really has been shown to help with heart disease and cancer and get, provide that antioxidant. So they did a study and they're just looking at, well, when people consume this, can we raise their blood levels, right? Because we know that when, when we give, you know, uh, gamma tocopherol, it's good, but is it actually getting in the body, right? And is, is there ways that we can measure it? So they had a study which they were just the, 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 the participants were just told to make muffins and they had like a recipe. I don't, I don't have the recipe. They had a recipe, but they were just eating muffins that were made with sesame seeds. That wasn't a lot just to like, you know, just like, like how we put flax muffins for breakfast. A lot of times people have flax muffins. So they did sesame seeds. And within three days, they were able to measure their blood in the, in these participants and find that the, the gamma tocopherol, which is the most strongest, better part of the sesame seed vitamin E component was actually very elevated, which is great because that means they're actually getting antioxidant benefit from a food actually circulating systemically through the body. It has been shown to lower cholesterol, particularly in postmenopausal women, lowering their bad cholesterol, the LDL. So very, very interesting, important. And also had a, uh, I didn't put it here, but there was some parts of the studies showing that it had a phytoestrogenetic effect kind of like how soy does. It's a preventative benefit. So it's not a stimulatory. It's not, it's not contraindicated for patients that have estrogen positive breast cancer, but it actually helps having this little bit of a balance naturally as a phytoestrogenic uh, effect. So that helps not only with heart health in women, but also helps with their bone density uh, and also helps with their hot flashes. Alzheimer's disease, as I mentioned before, you know, talking about memory function, again, sesame um, is the antioxidant found in sesame seeds. And it was found in the studies to stop the formation of beta amyloid, and that's the protein that's found in the plaques in Alzheimer's disease. Again, we're trying to look at what else can we do. So like taking a little sage helps the neurotransmitters, taking a little bit of sesame seeds or eating some hummus or, you know, or adding you know, sesame, sesame seed muffins, for example. Um, these are things that can also then help you know, prevent this cognitive decline that we see, uh, unfortunately, so much so today. And lastly, a very interesting Huntington's, Huntington's disease which is a genetic uh, central nervous system disease. And it's really, really tragic. It causes like a paralysis uh, and eventually also causes a dementia. And the study showed that it actually helped prevent the loss of muscle control and mental decline. So it slowed the progression of the, of the acceleration of this devastating disease. Sesame seed, right? Like we have no cure for hunting disease. Huntington's disease right now. So these are things that are really, really important because in other cultures, you know, when we see Huntington's disease going around and, you know, the certain population, certain people will just get it genetically and by, you know, just by the rate of, of how these things occur worldwide. But then we can see that some people who are consuming more of these foods who have it actually have a slower progression. So it's a pretty cool thing. They were actually able to show that. Um, now, what happens when, if we were just to take it for people who don't have it? Maybe it'll be something that we should be looking at for all patients who are aging and we're getting older. We get a little sarcopenic. We start losing a little bit of muscle mass. So this would be something that, well, gosh, if it's helping someone with this, this rare but serious central nervous system disease, and it helps prevent the, muscle, the loss of muscle control, meaning keeping the, the, the neurological function and to those nerves and muscles stronger, why don't we just have everybody start eating a little bit more sesame seeds? Now, examples, you know, most people will talk about tahini. It's a simple thing. You know, I like to put tahini on a, you know, like a piece of toast. It's a great thing. You can make a spread with it. Um, hummus, which is then you're blending the garbanzo beans and the uh, sesame seeds. Spinach and strawberry salads, cucumber and sesame salads. I like to sprinkle them on anything. You know, when we use a lot of Asian food, we use a lot of sesame seeds. So like when people use, they think of like, a, a, like if I go to a Vietnamese or a Chinese restaurant, vegan, obviously, but they will use like a sesame beef. These are all made out of like uh, vital wheat gluten or tempeh or tofu. Uh, same thing with the chicken, you know, green beans, sprinkling it on, you know, Japanese style, which I love. Um, and then bon comms. Uh, this is like Vietnamese. There are these, these wonderful, if you ever go to a Vietnamese restaurant, uh, pastry shops as well, they're like these sesame balls. Almost every culture in Asia will have these kind of sesame balls. These are fried, so you got to be careful of the oil too much. But it's, it's kind of like they have like a, a, a yellow bean or a red bean inside like a paste, and then it's really crispy on the outside and they roll, they roll it the sesame seeds. So these are ways that, you know, even as a dessert, you know, there's sesame seed cookies and stuff like that. You can start adding that. So just like people using flax, think of adding a little bit of sesame seed into the diet. This can be beneficial for a lot of things. Now it pairs with the following spices. Sesame seed pairs with allspice, cardamom, chili, cinnamon, clove, coriander, garlic, ginger, mint, mustard, nutmeg, onion, 
pumpkin seed and thyme. And uh, it complements with breads and biscuits, chickpeas, a great thing to add. Again, like any kind of vegan uh, mock meat product is really good. Noodles, obviously, most people put it in Asia and other places. We always put sesame seeds. Salad greens, again, wonderful thing to add. Um, same thing, you know, when we look at hemp seeds. So I kind of like to mix a lot of these like tiny, tiny little seeds. They don't really have too much of a taste, but they're really good in adding protein fiber, and in this case, the antioxidant benefits. Now, one thing I do want to talk about, I'm going to jump real quick. When we go back over here for the sesame oil and the sesame, in, how we activate some of that actually is by heating. So we actually, when we, when we actually make the oil in Ayurvedic medicine, when we do treatment, we actually lightly heat the oil, not to boil it because we can actually destroy some of those properties. But actually when you're doing is when you're heating the oil. So in Ayurvedic medicine, when we do these wonderful massages called Abhyanga, um, is that we take the oil, we heat it. And actually from that heating process, it actually starts to convert the molecules to produce more of the sesame oil antioxidants. So a lot of people, when they get a sesame oil, they just kind of use it like plain. And that we always have to tell people like, no, when in, in the studies, and even when people look at oil pulling, right? Sometimes they go, oh, we do this oil pulling for our mouth. The study doesn't show this, it doesn't show that sometimes. Uh, but yet in India, we like, we see all these studies showing positive benefits. And then on the Western studies, like, oh, they don't really show as much benefits as, as proclaimed. And it's because they're not heating the oil to actually convert it to, to make this super strong antioxidant. So there's ways to prepare things that a lot of people are not told about. And that's why like, we have to understand heat as a, as a part of cooking is very, very important. And just always having things raw, we might be losing some of the benefits. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention real quick is, let me just go back here. Uh, let me see if I have one more thing I want to talk about this because, um, yeah, I'll we'll talk about that on the next one. Star anise. Star anise is beautiful and healthy. I love the way this looks. It's one of the most to me visual appealing, cool looking things that you can put in a tea or put on a dessert, uh, you know, um, and, and, and cook with. Uh, it just has a, has a wonderful uh, appearance. The star anise has that wonderful like licorice for those people who like licorice tasting things like uh, it's got that nice licorice taste. Interesting thing, it has a lot of antiviral, uh, antibacterial benefits, but a lot of antiviral benefits. So, you know, data for flu, Epstein-Barr virus, septic shock, a different, uh, it helps inhibiting certain mouth bacteria and, and cold sore viruses, HIV and hepatitis. This is where the star anise becomes really, really important. Now, one thing just to note is that the star anise has about eight of these little posts. I forget the name that they call them, but there's, there's specific little uh, like leave parts of it. And there has been uh, adulteration in the uh, star anise market. And several years ago, and every once in a while, you start hearing about, you know, problems. And the problems is there's something called Japanese star anise, where instead of eight of these, there's 10 or 12. So there's just more. It's, it's like a more leaves to this kind of hard shell. And the star anise that is correct, like this one, it's going to be a light brown to a dark brown. Um, and when you rub it with your fingers, you know, you'll you see the little seed in the middle kind of thing. And that will just kind of give that little, it gives a little bit of a fragrance. It should smell like licorice. It ha should have a sweet smell to it. Um, and the Japanese star anise, which is the one that actually is dangerous, actually poisonous, is that a lot of companies were getting the other kind because they didn't know. I just that's what happens. And they were just, you know, packaging or powdering it or selling it in spice mixes, and people were getting sick. Uh, and some of them having some really, really bad problems. And originally what happens, there was such a scare at one time, this is many years ago, about 10 years ago, that uh, the FDA was called in because you know. Well, all these products come in here. When you think of like Chinese five spice, you know, it's one of the things that we use in Chinese, or we're using a lot of these Chinese um, rubs, like say on a Peking duck, or uh, we can even do vegan Peking duck, by the way. But, you know, when we use some of these nice, wonderful aromatic and kind of they add it with the cinnamon and other uh, spices, it's a great thing. But since there's so much adulteration in the industry, um, you know, I always like to recommend people when they get star anise to buy the full spice itself, not already pre-ground. Now, when you get a, a, a Chinese five spice and those kind of things like that, it will definitely be ground. Uh, so you just want to make sure that you're just getting it from a reputable company, something like at, at a health store or a grocery market, most likely will be vetted. 
I try to avoid just buying something really cheap online that you've never heard of because there's no traceability usually on things that are sometimes that are just unknown online. Um, and also making sure that that'll be making sure that you're not going to get the uh, adulterated form of the one that has 10 or more. Also, the, the Japanese star anise, which is poisonous, it also smells like turpentine. So it's definitely not like, you know, if you were to get it, you'd be like, wow, this smell, or, you know, or if you got a spice mix and you go, gosh, it smells like turpentine, has that kind of really noxious smell to it, then it's definitely uh, something that you should not be consuming. Now, the benefits of star anise are it was very interesting. It's a very strong flu fighter. This is something that I just learned uh, when I was going over this information. You know, we use it a lot. Uh, in Chinese medicine, they use a lot. They use a lot in other cultural medicines uh, because of that licorice flavor. So, uh, so as well as like when we make um, syrups and tinctures for like respiratory tract and GI, it helps with relieving gas and 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 uh, it helps with appetite. It helps with a little bit of inflammation. But we use it a lot for like when we use upper respiratory infections for clearing mucus and stuff. We always have a little bit of star anise in there because of that licorice flavor. So it's giving both some of this antivirus effect antibacterial effect, but also having a wonderful taste because sometimes, as most people know, that medicines usually never taste very good um, and they might be bitter. It has something called shikamic acid, and this is an active component of the star anise. And in fact, that is the starter ingredient of the drug that is made for Tamiflu. So like when people are like, oh, I go get Tamiflu, which is the prescription that people take to knock out that flu virus. Um, it's very interesting. Like the, the, the starter part of that drug is the molecule that is coming from this. So this, this is why historically star anise has been used in other cultures for this benefit. It has been shown uh, to help with HIV, lowering some of the viral growth, Epstein-Barr, it inhibits the growth of Epstein-Barr, which causes mono. Now, most people, if you don't know, or I might give a lecture later on on long COVID, we know that people that have chronic fatigue post COVID been 30 million Americans are having, you know, this, this post COVID syndromes, long COVID syndromes of that people who have fatigue, 30% have a reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus. However, there's nothing really conventionally to really knock it out. We have a lot of natural herbs that are antiviral, but this is something that people can start adding if they have Epstein-Barr virus. It does show, it has been shown to inhibit cold sores, uh, limits the viral activity 99%. You know, a lot of people are taking, you know, Valtrex and acyclovir and all these, you know, you know, these drugs to help lower their cold sore outbreaks and their herpes outbreaks. And this is something like, why not we just start, you know, and I'll show you, like, you can have some star anise, put in some tea, you know, have it in, you know, cook with it. These are things uh, that can be easily used that will have this preventative uh, benefit. Uh, there's some uh, studies looking at reducing the deadly system from some septic shock, which is a you know complete bacterial infection uh, systemically. And since it's very strong, they're looking at in some of the studies how that can be utilized uh, because it has this kind of broad spectrum approach. And then also there's some oral studies looking at um, certain bacteria that are dangerous that like when from bites when people get bitten or you know, say like someone's in a prison or something like that or a fight. Um, some of these, these bacteria, E. coridans, uh, the mouth bacteria is very dangerous. This star anise helps destroy that without, you know, and protects the rest of the mouth. Also fights, fights against streptococcus mutans, which is one of the main bacteria that causes cavities. So what a wonderful thing that you can do if someone has a history of cavities, why don't we just make some tea or cook with this and, and just kind of sip on it all the time and get a local beneficial effect rather than using than sterilizing the mouth with some antibacterial mouthwashes, which now we know is knocking out the good bacteria, oral probiotics and stuff in the mouth and causing worsening symptoms. So examples are, you know, we use, we use a lot of star anise. Yeah, I, I particularly use it more in more Asian cooking. Uh, and so like when we think of like pho, like Vietnamese soups, uh, Chinese five spice baked tofu, which is one of my favorite star anise tea. Again, you can make it as a tea, just drop one or two and boil it. Uh, then you can even mix it with any other tea. So some people are like, I want that licorice flavor, but I still need something else. Well, you can put it with the black tea if you want caffeine or green tea or anything else. And that's that, that sweetness of the uh, licorice sometimes makes it so that people don't need to have any kind of sweetener. You don't need to put honey or stevia or monk fruit. You can just enjoy that natural licorice tasting sweetness already. You can put it with rice as a flavoring, just kind of how we put like cardamom and, and we put saffron in rice. This is something that also you can throw the uh, star anise in, in, the, in the rice cooker or Instapot and then give it that little bit of that licorice, that sweet kind of aromatic flavor. Again, these are like little secrets that you can add in. When we do like vegan Peking duck, if you ever go to these fancy, wonderful Asian places that they've been doing this for 
century. So it's not a new thing, by the way. But they have like this. These are dishes which they usually use again with them. Seitan or vital wheat gluten. They make kind of like a mushu with the pancake and the and the crispy uh, uh, vegan meat. Uh, vegan meats. Uh, that uh, star anise is one of the main spices that is used to make that crispiness and have that kind of sweetness. And then also, you know, in India, you know, a lot of us know about chai. I spoke about chai before. I'll talk about it probably when I finish uh, with turmeric later on. Uh, you know, we talked about different like spices that we put in teas and black pepper and 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 um, cinnamon. But Kashmiri chai is actually when we use the uh, Kashmiri leaves, uh, tea leaves, and then we, you know, we use star anise to actually help with a little bit of that licorice taste. But it turns into this wonderful pink color. Uh, so for those people who are all into the Barbie, it's kind of a fun thing that you can do with your with with your with your children or your friends. If you like to have a pink party, you can definitely make some Kashmiri chai, uh, and you can make that all vegan. You don't have to put dairy. You can just put coconut milk or any other plant based milk would be fine. Star anise pairs with allspice, black pepper, cardamom, chili, cinnamon, cumin, curry leaf, ginger, fennel seed, mint, nutmeg, and vanilla. So I love it because it goes with like some of the sweet and spicy and a little bit hot, but, you know, know, tantalizing flavors. So I love to add the star anise into it. And uh, it's great. It complements, you know, again, vegan chicken, custards, uh, fruits, mangoes, uh, again, vegan mock meats, uh, soups, stir fries, and syrups. One thing, just letting you know, uh, it's one of my it's one of my favorite uh, recipes, and I'll probably share the recipe uh, in one of my episodes in the future. I make one of the best. Well, I won't say me, but I mean, I, I've I've got a couple of recipes, and I blended uh, like three recipes together to make the best chili crisp. And I know there's a lot of uh, news about you know people. Um, trademarking the chili crisp and mumu focos and all these things and everybody's suing everybody for the name chili crisp i just have figured out the recipe that actually makes it something that's better than all of theirs but it takes a lot of ingredients there's about a, a, more than a dozen ingredients and when you look at the store they, they you buy these some of these these kind of chili oils they might only have like five ingredients and it's like that's the, that's not the real uh, chili oil we like to go further and star anise is one of the many ingredients that we use when we make a chili oil. And I might share that with everybody. I know uh, we're, we're not supposed to talk about too much about oils, but these are things that we're trying to concentrate. You can actually use lesser oil, but it's using that higher concentrate of getting all those phytochemicals, phytonutrients from the um, spices that when you put a little bit, say, in a stir fry, it's actually giving you a higher concentrate of all those antioxidants, polyphenols, and wonderful, wonderful components. And lastly, today, we're going to talk about sun-dried tomatoes, um, the guardians of men's health. Now, it's very interesting because sun-dried tomatoes, you know, tomato itself is always classified. And it's very interesting because botanists, half of them will say it's a fruit and half of them will say, and as you know, people will say it's a vegetable, right? We think of it more as a vegetable. But when it's dried as a sun-dried tomato, as the word says, sun-dried tomato, it's actually considered a spice. So that's what most people don't think about. Like, oh, I didn't think about us being a spice. Because usually when we dry it, then they actually, usually, usually when most people get it at the store or something, it's usually sometimes kept in a little bit of an oil, like an olive oil or something like that, right? So then a lot of people think of it being moist, but actually it becomes a spice when it's dried. Um, the data shows that it may help and prevent or treat uh, blood clots, cancer, cholesterol problems, dementia, heart attack, heart disease, high blood pressure, infertility in males, osteoporosis, very interesting, and Parkinson's disease. Now, wonderful things about sun-dried tomatoes. Man, there's so much research. And in this book, there's pages of stuff. I was like, wow, there's a lot of information. So let's start off with prostate cancer because what most people think about tomatoes. Um, lycopene, as we all know, is the antioxidant that's heavily found in tomatoes. Uh, but when we sun-dry the tomato, or, or, or you can even use an air, um, a food, uh, food dehydrator, right? So traditionally, it's a long process to dry it in the sun, and that's why there's certain environments and places that do that, right? But uh, you can easily just do it in your food uh, dehydrator. So those people who have that, you can make sun-dried tomatoes really, really easily. But why there's sometimes a significant cost, just letting you know, because it takes about 10 tomatoes to make about an ounce once it's dried, because most of the tomatoes water weight. But when you're drying it, what you're doing is you're hyper concentrating and you're just raising those components super, super high. Right. So it's like, how do we make the food, you know, more medicinal, more antioxidant, more anti-cancer is by actually on this case is drying it out. Higher the consumption in the studies. So men who eat higher tomatoes had a 19 percent lower risk of prostate cancer, just eating more. 
<clears throat> and when they had newly diagnosed patients who consumed tomato sauce, so just looking at, you know, just like, you know, have some more po having pasta, you know, just more of the sauce of tomatoes, you, tomato dishes, three weeks after they were diagnosed with prostate cancer, their PSA, which is the test that we're mod modifying, the, uh, measuring their growth of their prostate. In this case, if there's prostate cancer, it can be very elevated, drop 20%. So lowering the PSA also when someone's taking the hormone blocker. So when men have prostate cancer, they give them a hormone blocker that blocks testosterone. So in the studies, they, you know, that's the standard of care. They give the hormone blocker to block testosterone, just like how women have breast cancer. They, and if it's estrogen positive, they give them a hormone blocker to block the estrogen. So these are the hormones that in those specific hormone sensitive tissues, in this case, prostate uh, with testosterone in men, it can then further increase the growth. So they give a hormone blocker, but when they give the hormone blocker, plus have the person take lycopene or eat more tomatoes, they had a significant, much lower, meaning a better response from the cancer growth. So this is something that, you know, adding to every prostate cancer patient should be eating, you know, sun-dried tomatoes, should be adding more pasta, meaning more pasta sauce, meaning, uh, and also you can make it without, you know, much oil, you can make it with less sugar. So you can actually just even have sun-dried tomatoes and we'll give some ideas for that. It does kill breast cancer cells in the cell culture and the higher the lycopene levels, um, it's been shown for those people who consume the higher levels, they had lower polyps. So by 35%, uh, the, the, the patients uh, who have actually colon pops have lower lycopene levels. So again, the higher the levels of lycopene, the lower the risk of developing a polyp, the lower the, 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 the lycopene levels, the higher rate of getting a colon polyp and the higher rate of getting colon polyps over time can put a person at risk of getting colon cancer. It's been shown to inhibit gliomas, which is brain cancer cells. And it's also been showing to lower risk of pancreatic, bladder, cervix, lung, stomach, and blood cancers. So what a wonderful thing to do is just by having, I mean, this is why people love to go and, and go to Italy, for example, and eat a lot of the tomatoes. Heart health. So lycopene lowers the rate of heart attacks. And the more that you eat, the better. So someone that was eating seven to 10 servings a week had the lowest risk out of all the people in the study, rather than someone who's having it just like two times a month. So again, more the better. Obviously, why? Because you're getting the, all the antioxidants, all the polyphenols, all the color, protein, and fiber. Um, it does lower some uh, your bad cholesterol by 13% and the total cholesterol by 6%. So it's not bad. It does still lower your heart disease risk, but it reduced the blood clotting risk by 72%. And that study was using the amount of tomatoes, six whole tomatoes that they would put it like concentrate in a pill. So if you were someone's eating that, you know, it lowers the blood clotting risk. So if they're kind of constantly eating a lot of pasta, sorry, a lot of tomato sauce or a lot of tomatoes, putting it in the salad, making it, uh, you know, in, 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 in sauces and then having sun-dried tomatoes, it's an easy thing to add as a hyper concentrate. It does also lower blood sugar, uh, blood pressure. So 146 to 132 drop in systolic, 82 to 78. Again, not super powerful, not as strong as the previous spices that I talked about. But what happens when people start eating a whole food plant-based diet, we start adding all these things. There's a stacking effect. If you go back to my healing spices, number one, and listen to all the way here, you'll see how many of these things are lowering cholesterol. Almost all of these spices and herbs have a little bit of heart health benefit, blood sugar benefit, osteoporosis benefit, you know, memory benefit, um, you know, physiological function benefit, lowering gut issue benefits. And so the idea is that that's why when people go plant-based, you know, 80% of almost all their conditions start to resolve because there's a stacking effect of all these nutritional uh, aspects that are super, super important. One of the things that we see is osteoporosis support. So lycopene stimulates the cells that build your bone, the osteoblasts, and, and it blocks the osteoclasts. Those are the cells that destroy the bone. So it's very interesting because, you know, postmenopausal women, what happens is the system wants to put them on Fosamax, Reclass, Boniva, all these kind of drugs, which is, you know, doing the same thing. But it's like, can we not just eat more tomatoes? and have some sun-dried tomatoes as something that works very similar in actions, but doesn't cause the side effects? Absolutely. The problem is, you know, if we look at the data for those people who consume more, they'll have lesser osteoporosis. And again, similar to like what we see in the colon pops, those who have lower levels will actually have higher levels of osteoporosis. So something that you can be doing very, very, very nicely. And then male infertility. So 25% of infertile, infertile males have what they call high ROS, reactive oxy, oxygen species, right? It's kind of like damage to the cells. 
That's why we need more antioxidants in their semen. So when they took a, an eight milligram lycopene supplement, which is the concentration of the tomatoes, right? Uh, for a year, they showed significant, uh, significant improvements in the sperm quality. And then out of that in the study, 36%, so a third of the people, the men were able to get their partners pregnant, which is fantastic, right? Because they're not doing like super expensive in vitro fertilization and using drugs and, you know, all sorts of procedures like this is also not only helping their fertility, it's helping their heart rates, helping them prevent them from getting prostate cancer, helping their bone health, helping their memory. So, you know, there's no loss of, of adding uh, this to the diet, especially a male that has some fertility problems. Parkinson's disease. So the lower blood levels of Parkinson's, uh, people that had lower levels were found to have more uh, vascular dementia, which is the second most common kind of dementia and Parkinson's disease. So again, lower levels of antioxidants just increase of all types of antioxidants, but here we're talking about lycopene with, with tomatoes particularly, just lowers your risk of everything, right? Because you become pro-oxidant, you get oxidative stress, oxidative damage. And then when I consult with my patients, we're able to do testing, interesting, and this is what was part of the discussion I just did on The Real Truth About Health, about the test that your doctor usually doesn't order for you. But we can actually then measure, like, are you having oxidative stress? Um, and what is that level? And, you know, what is your antioxidants, vitamin A, C, E, CoQ10, glutathione, alpha lipoic? How are you detoxifying? And how are you, you know, are you in a pro-oxidant state or an antioxidant state? Even if you are on a plant-based diet, you still have to measure those levels because then you might not be eating, eating enough of those things. Or there might be microbiome difficulties or differences that if we all eat the same meals, we're all going to have different parts of our test show different results. And that's why we like to individualize uh, and measure those levels. So it's really interesting when you see higher levels of blood levels is increased to improved ability to perform self-care tasks. So again, just like the sage, now we're talking about tomatoes. So why don't we make the pasta that has some tomato sauce or some, some dried tomatoes with some sage, you know, cooked in the pasta sauce. And then why don't we start serving this as we're getting older to help people with memory and, and, and self-care tasks so that we can start helping us you know, not become so dependent and debilitated, but kind of extend our quality of life and improve our longevity, protects the brain from, again, the ROS. So again, it's not only helping the uh, male fertility, it's also helping the brain uh, uh, from damaging oxidative stress. Now, one thing I wanted to mention before also is that a lot of people who are plant-based, they sometimes li like to think that raw foods are better raw, raw, raw. So let me eat raw tomatoes, raw, you know, my salad, raw, raw, raw. And I've showed before, it's like when we cook and we heat things, you actually improve the absorption of these nutrients. So when it comes to the benefits of tomato, the studies will show that when, to, when tomatoes is heated into a pasta sauce, it's four times the absorption of the lycopene components and antioxidant benefits. And also then also when we heat it just by itself, uh, it's, a, it's about three times. Right. So there's so we actually, you know, I always go back to this. We invented fire for a reason and metabolically and culinary wise. That's why we usually heat most of our food. So it doesn't mean we can't have raw tomatoes and we can have some raw salads and stuff. But there's a lot of people who are pushing this extreme of like we need to eat everything raw, thinking that they're actually getting like all the nutrients. And now the data is going to show the opposite. It's like that's why like they can get benefits from eating raw tomato. But I'd rather get three or four times the benefits from the tomato by cooking it a little bit or making it to a sauce, or even in this case, sun drying it. So that would be happy for those people who don't want to heat anything and they're trying raw. Well, why don't we just sun dry it and you actually will maximize that nutrient density for getting the maximum benefits of the sun dried tomato. So examples is going to be again, pasta, pasta, pasta. You know, you can make it even sun dried tomato pesto. Uh, we like to make chutneys in India with sun dried tomatoes. Uh, there's a wonderful vegan goulash. Uh, people make chili with it. Uh, roasted vegetable pizzas. I love it on pizza. It's one of my favorite things to add. It has that kind of sweet and tanginess and sourness. I, I just love sun-dried tomatoes. It's one of my favorite things that you can always throw into a dish. Uh, and it just kind of adds a uniqueness of flavor to that. And it pairs and complements with basil, chili, fennel seed, garlic, onion, oregano, parsley, rosemary, and thyme. And it complements, again, especially when you're looking at any of the vegan beefs, vegan cheeses, uh, vegan chickens, even vegan eggs, you know, because we like to like put the sun-dried tomatoes on a scramble, for example, green beans, pasta, soups, and stews. So sun-dried tomatoes, eat as much as you can or eat them regularly, just regular tomatoes, eat them regularly. Try to get organic when you can because tomatoes are, are one of the common heavily sprayed pesticide items. Um, and to try to incorporate that into your diet. 
what I do want to end off with is that um, I just want to announce that coming soon, we are going to be launching our podcast. And so I'll invite Chef AJ as one of the guests uh, on our show, but uh, it's called Take Back Your Health. We're going to bring it back uh, what we had many years ago. So if you go to our website, sendjevany.net or sendjevany store, uh, you can sign up to the newsletter and then we will let you know once our first episode hits the airwaves. And I also want to just uh, remind everybody that I am available for telehealth and in-person consultations. We do the testing. We can do everything from afar. Most of my, pe- my, 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 my clients are actually um, from Zoom and, and, and away from me. So I can always give you an extra pair of eyes and ears uh, and looking at your dietary supplements, your medications, your laboratory uh, results, and, and give you an, a, a, an evidence-based approach of how you can start using natural, clinically effective uh, therapies, dietary changes, how to help you move plant-based, how to also make sure that you can um, look at food sensitivity testing, microbiome testing, nutrition, et cetera. I'm always available to help uh, you if you're interested. And by that, I want to thank everybody. This is part seven, sorry, part 11 of the uh, healing spices, sage, sesame seeds, star anise, and sun-dried tomato. Nice. I love sun-dried tomato too, by the way. Yeah, it's one of the things. And, you know, most people don't think of it as a spice. I, I never thought of it as a spice as well. But, it, but by definition, it's like once it's dried, it, it becomes a spice. And that's how we, you know, because a lot of people, when they get it, it's actually kept as a, as a dried you know, in, in glass. We just usually see it, you know, like when we buy sun-dried tomatoes, it's usually in an oil. So we really think it's kind of softer and all, but when you dry it, in fact, you know, you can, sun, you know, you can um, dehydrate it. And what you can do is when you put it in glass, it will stay for a very long time. Um, and then you can just reconstitute it if you like to. So if some, some people like to, you know, have that crispiness. Uh, and that's why we put in the oil. It, it makes it a little bit softer, but you can just reconstitute it in the water, make it, you know, set it for like 20 minutes. It'll become softer again. And then you can cook with that if you like. So if some people want to avoid the oil, I know that you want to be lower oil. So it's like, that's, you can still get that benefit, but just dehydrating it is easy so that you don't have to actually buy it in the oil and try to take it off. Or some people like I try to pat it down with a paper towel. Uh, that's one, uh, nice thing. And, and now that we have these dehydrators that are really inexpensive now, I mean, you can go to any store now, it used to be super expensive, but now these are things that people can dehydrate dehydrate, uh, I would say that's a great thing to start adding, especially if you want to sneak in more of these antioxidants into a pasta to your family's meals, or if you're making something like, how do I add a little bit more punch, a little bit more antioxidant, a little bit more anti, you know, cancer, a little bit more bone support, a little bit more brain support uh, with that. Uh, And it's not like eating a lot because remember it's a hyper concentrate. So that's why by having a little bit of these things added into just a normal pasta sauce or any kind of sauce itself, that's just throwing a little bit of the sun-dried tomatoes, even on a pizza is very, very beneficial. Well, do you know, I've been using sun-dried tomato powder since 2008 when I first started, you know, really decreasing salt and stopped cooking with it. And the, the person that has a show this, the day after you, Nick DeVorn from Local Spicery, he taught me that there's a difference between tomato powder and sun-dried tomato powder. And yeah. sun-dried tomato powder is much tastier because yeah. tomato it's powder. Right, because yeah. he explained tomato powder is just where they kind of like liquefy tomatoes and dry it. But it, right. it, it's correct. It's, and did you know that I, I believe I read that it takes about four pounds of tomatoes to make three ounces of sun-dried tomatoes? Yeah, because it's about, it's about 10, uh, 10 tomatoes for an ounce. Yeah, so it's a lot. So when you, you know, so like, so be prepared, like when you slice it and you put in your dehydrator, all of a sudden you, you have your tray and everything is going to be, you know, like when you dehydrate vegetables, everything shrinks and you're not sure. You're like, wait, I cut a ball. So I had trays of this stuff. But, but that's why it's a little expensive when you get it right. And that people don't understand is because you're taking so much to, to, you're taking out all that water volume. Now I like people to have, you know, the tomatoes also just by itself, because especially as we get older or like right now in the summertime, you know, and it's getting hot, a lot of people don't drink enough water or not as high. Hydrated, so I, you know, it's a high water containing uh, vegetable or fruit or spice, as you want to call it here. Um, I, I love like the high water containing vegetables. So people eating a lot of tomatoes is one way to sneak in hydration in those people who are not drinking a lot or getting hydrated just directly from fluids. Have you ever dehydrated watermelon? You got to find a magnifying glass to find it afterwards. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. It's so funny. Yeah, I, I, it has such a depth of flavor, sun-dried tomatoes and sun-dried yeah. tomato powders. It's a, to it's, me, it's like, a, it's like a, it's a richer and a deeper and a little bit of sweeter taste. That's, that's my, you know, and so I just, I, I really find like real tomato essence uh, when I have a sun-dried tomato. And uh, I, I think it's something that, again, people can add, especially men as we're, we're concerning about prostate as we get older. 
and people are concerned about their prostate, their PSA and other things like that. And, and if they take a supplement with lycopene, that's one thing, but I prefer that if they can get it from their diet, then they're feeding their nutrition along with their, you know, feeding your belly as well as your prostate at the same time is a good thing. You mentioned that there are certain micronutrients that are more bioavailable when cooked, like the lycopene and tomato, but isn't that true for other things like the carotenoids and carrots and sweet potatoes and the lutein and greens as well? Yeah, that's why I like cooking. So I'm not like, you know, like, like a lot of people who come see me, there's a certain sub segment who will just be completely raw. And what we find is that with completely raw people, their nutrient levels are not as high as they would want, you know, because they're like, I'm eating all this stuff. I'm not, you know, overheating. I'm not just cooking it, da, 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 thinking. So the idea is like, you know, you're getting the essence of the food and you're just consuming it. But the idea is that all of this stuff has fiber, all this stuff has cellulose. They all have like, you know, layers of part of the plant that, you know, it's, it's more, it's easier released when there is cooking. Now, understandably, we don't want to be microwaving all the food and, and boiling it all day, which is what happens in standard American diet or if you go to a buffet. So that's where I understandably these people want to go this other direction. But, you know, making the foods more palatable and also for people that have more of a vata constituency where their gut is more sensitive, they need to have a little bit more water. They need to have more oil. They need to have a little bit more softer foods or people who have chemotherapy or gut issues. You know, a lot of people like want to go raw, but like when we test our microbiome, Biome, like their microbiome cannot handle, like if they have low digestive enzymes, pancreatic enzymes, which we measure in testing now, like then we like people who are raw or, or they're having more raw foods and they have low pancreatic enzymes and digestive enzymes functioning. It's really difficult for them to break down the foods. They actually feel more bloated and gassy. And so then they're not extracting from that wonderful food or the, with the intention to get that full nutrient benefit. So I'm a, I'm a strong believer. And that's why, you know, most people cook. You know, so yeah. it's, it's important to bring, you know, cooking. Now, again, there's extremes of cooking, but, you know, bringing back some of those things is, is, is very, very important. So it's not just swinging the pendulum to the other direction. Well, you said we invented cooking. Maybe we discovered cooking. Yeah. You know, well, because we invented the fire, we discovered fire. Right. So right. There's, but there's a reason why, like, we still keep it <laughs> and we still use it. You know, otherwise it faded away like, oh, we don't we just eat everything raw. We don't eat everything raw. And so and, and right now there's still no culture that really still truly eats everything raw we still like to cook now again doesn't mean that we can't have you know fruit and this and that and there's certain raw dishes definitely that we eat but we kind of lose that element when people just go only raw and they're just juicing or blending they're still missing some of the other aspects of how we actually extract those nutrients and then when we measure that we can actually show them like this is why you're still tired this is why you still because these antioxidants are low your b vitamins are low your your nutrients your, your minerals are low and it's like but i'm eating so much of these foods it's like well why don't you heat it a little bit and then you get four times that number then you don't have you know, to eat as much. So there's a little bit of that benefit. But the raw food, the people that are raw, they really believe in what they believe doing. it, but the science is different, right? So everybody, everybody can believe what they want. I tell them that, but the science is a science. Like your data is your data. You got to own it. And when people come to me and they're like, oh, I think I'm fantastic. If they are, I'll give them, you know, hey, you are fantastic. But, but in general, most people come in, it's like, this is why I'm feeling this way. And this is why I'm talking to you. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it's, it's because we want, they want to feel better. They want to, you know, it's not like saying you're doing something wrong. Never get me. Don't, don't misinterpret that. It's just that a lot of people are putting a lot of effort, but they're not getting their biggest bang for their health return. And so it's not about all doing one thing. It's a little bit of a lot of things. And by certain nuances, by looking at their, how their body's actually processing, we can then tell them also what more foods to eat more. Right. So the goal is like if you're low in B2 or B1 or you're low in vitamin A, we can tell you like these are the foods that you should be eating more of. Right. So you can get food as medicine. But unless you test, how do you know? Everybody says that they feel great. Everybody even in plant based, they feel great. But that doesn't mean their nutrients levels are, are lower. Right. Because they can, you know, healthy plant based people still get cancer. Healthy plant based people can still have heart disease. Right? They can still be in a producer or an absorber. Or, you know, so, so that has nothing to do with diet, right? And so it can be like their liver's just producing more. So we still have to reduce the risk. And that's what I gave the lecture just most recently on. is like, even those people who are doing the right thing, which we are telling them to do, and that's what the research shows that you should be doing, you can still have dysfunction or imbalance, right? Uh, and, or you can have a toxicity or deficiency and not even know it. it's not the person's fault. That's just how we, unique we are. And until we discover that or investigate that, then we're kind of hitting our heads against the wall, doing the same thing over and over, not getting better results. Yep. Thank you. Uh, one of the viewers on Instagram named Boutique Bo says, what was the name of the inflammation book you suggested? An Inflammation Nation. Nice. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, let me uh, see if I have a copy here just to do the shameless plug that I don't mind doing, but <laughs> no, we don't mind at all. 
There we go. It's also available on Audible for those people who like to listen. Um, and if you order it uh, from our office at uh, we'll sign you, give you a signed copy of it. And anyways. That sounds great. So Ju um, uh, Judy watching on Facebook says, I'm curious why oil is being promoted. While oil is being promoted? Why oil is being promoted. Because so this is the anti oil question I'm I'm assuming because you certain people need oil oilation right so like without the sesame seeds you're not getting that strong antioxidant effect right and so those people who don't take oils I mean there's a lot of people who are uh, you know no oil but when you look at a blue zone person they're not no oil the longest surviving people on the planet who are plant based are not no oil. Now don't get me wrong on the flip side the average American is consuming way too much oil of all kind, right? Packaged food, fried foods, even vegans, right? Because we can still eat French fries every day and, and then potato chips and stuff like that. So don't get me wrong. Like there's not a health benefit of adding too much, but there is a health benefit of still having avocados and seeds and nuts and, and those kind of things and even olives. Um, and, and, and when we look at sesame seeds, right? So that when we look at historically then, who has been using sesame oil? India, China, you know, why are these populations have a better benefit of taking it? Now, in America, like we fried everything in bad oil and too much. So, yes, there's an extreme of like we don't need that fat calorie. doesn't have any benefits from that standpoint. But when you look at culinary aspect of cooking, so if anybody doesn't understand cooking, then when we look at spices, we always put, and this is a science. This is not like someone advocating pro-oil. This is like how do you advocate pro-health is understanding how you culinary cook with spices because how you activate the spice is in a little bit of oil, always. It doesn't mean a lot. Now, again, everybody's pouring oil, too much oil. But when you look at how do you activate any of the spices, any of these things that I'm talking about, when we just throw it in something raw, you're not actually getting that full phytochemical, phytonutrient benefits. And so that's why we use a little bit of oil. Thank you. And this is a comment from a different Judy. Since reading Healing Spices about sage, I've been putting it directly in my hot cocoa drink, a half a teaspoon. Is this safe? I bought Healing Spices because of this series. I don't think it's not safe. I don't know. How, I haven't really thought of how that would taste yet. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out the sage and the cocoa. I don't think, I think it's fine. Uh, however you want to put it in your food, that's great. You can grow sage too. You know, those are one of those things that can grow in, in a nice little garden. So I'm all for adding the sage. You know, even they burn sage, right? Like we use it in Native American cultures and all that stuff for saging. Uh, we use it for a lot of religious purposes and clearing, clear, you know, but also as a mental uh, benefit as well. So, yeah, putting it in, in any kind of beverage is fine. I like to cook with it as a sauce. You know, one of the things I was reading, you know, in the book is like they actually kind of do a, a, a tempura with it. And, and again, there's the oil thing. You can actually do a light and put it in an air fryer or something like that. But having it as even like something to throw on something is kind of a, a newer idea. I usually usually use it in like pasta and Italian food in that way. But um, yeah, you can definitely put it in a beverage. I think the idea is adding all the things I've been talking about, especially since you have the book, is to explore. I think the fun thing about cooking is not being so rigid and not being stuck. It, try it. If you like it, there's no harm in it. So, And I think it's, an, it's only going to give you the benefit rather than taking tons and tons of supplements. And you'll probably see that in half the spices that I talk about, there's a company that's now extracting it and patenting it and giving it in a high farm. And I'm not against that when we need to reverse a disease, when we're trying to look at avoiding a pharmaceutical side effect and then, hey, let's take this compound. But why not let's just eat it and enjoy it? And then and over time, we're just reducing all these parameters going around and around and around. So definitely, I'm really glad that you bought the book uh, because it's a great thing. I learned so much. I like the historical sections, you know, talking about when it was used, how long it's been using, who's been using it. To me, that's a fascinating part of food. It makes a great topic of discussion at dinner time and when the guests come over. And it also makes you really appreciate when we go to a restaurant or your grandmother would make a dish and she spent so much time in the kitchen with love and intention, why they put those things. And also through the industrialization of food, how we've lost a lot of ingredients, even with the chili oil I was talking about, the traditional chili oil, we'd have all these ingredients. Now we're going to mass market, people are trademarking it and they have like five ingredients. Helpful, but not as helpful as the traditional you know, cultures would provide. So um, I'm really glad that you bought the book and definitely I, I don't think it's any problem putting it with the cacao. Yeah, I wonder how that tastes. That's it. Because when I think of sage, I think of like turkey and stuff. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. well, we have this like, you know, sage and thyme and there's rosemary. Like we have these kind of flavors that kind of go together. What I also will probably do one of the episodes is that they have these spice blends and maybe we'll do a, a couple of episodes on spice blends or something like that. 
Nice. Rich says, has anybody gotten any of, of these great benefits from adding all these things into their diet? I'm hearing everybody saying that they do all these things, but has anybody gotten good results? Well, I can say the people who don't put all these things in their diet don't do better. <laughs> Right. Like, you, you know, because you can eat fast food, you can eat at a standard American restaurant and it has really none of these things, really. I mean, maybe some dried tomato if you went to a pasta place, but really even then that's not going to be significant in terms of all. Well, then they'll be putting butter and cream and, you know, terrible, like, you know, not even really good pasta or wheat and stuff like that. So there's, there's an issue that, you know, when we look at the culture. So, again, going back to the blue zones, when you look at the blue zone people, right, which are plant based. Right. And they are different people, right. Different places like from Osaka to Okinawa to uh, to uh, Costa Rica to Loma Linda and all sort of stuff like that. It's like they're eating a variety of foods, but those foods are really flavorful. And so, again, my whole push of just the spices, not only for the healing part of it, but actually it's for the culinary taste part of it. Because in order for us, at least, again, this is my opinion, in order for us to transition as many people in America to be plant-based, plant-forward, more than plant-forward, but plant-based, like they really need to be plant-based. And, and to move them as much as we can, it has to be flavorful. It has to hit their palate and go, this is delicious food. They should not know the difference. Uh, they should not crave what they're what they were previously having. And if you do that correctly, if you know, if you go to a great vegan restaurant where there's like real chefs, like you know, like that are top of their game, they can make anything, and uh, any non-vegan would never know. And that's what I like about using spices and flavors because that's what we actually crave in all the kind of traditional standard American diet is flavors. But now those things have been artificialized by adding more salt, more sugar, more fat, uh, and also flavor enhancers to to make everything hyper responsive but going back to traditional foods and that's why when people usually travel overseas what they really enjoy of the culture is eating their foods and i'm, I'm a big uh a proponent and advocate of people traveling around the world and understanding and seeing that in person saying wow why are these people living 80 years 90 years 100 years old not having the comorbid conditions that we do and then you look at their kitchen and go wow that's interesting like we don't have that in our kitchens as much or we're not eating that or our parents or our grandparents are in the nursing home they're not getting that food and that's what i'm trying to advocate for is trying to get even these better foods in those facilities thank you and we have asking a question annette can I use sesame seeds instead of sesame oil to reduce my blood pressure? I think you can. The question would be how much? So I think the idea is, was, is to add it, just like they were talking about, like they put it in the muffins, they put it in the cooking. What I do is I'd find a certain amount, like a, ta a tablespoon of sesame seeds, for example, figure out how to use it in the cooking regularly or whatever the amount is. And then just measure that weekly over, because it's going to take some time. It's not going to just drop it immediately. But like in the studies with the, with the sesame oil, they just changed a little bit of the oil to get more of that hyper concentrate. You can still get that oil from the seeds because that's where it's coming from, right? The idea is that you might just have to eat a little bit more seeds. But the benefit of eating a little bit more seeds is that you're also going to get more fiber you know, and a little bit more protein from it. So that's, that's also a positive benefit. So I would, what I would do is I'd, I'd find a fixed measurement. And, and then start adding it. But what I look at is go back to the previous episodes that I've mentioned before, because almost every four spices, one or two of them had blood pressure benefits. So the idea is like, it's not just like, oh, I got to just do sesame, sesame, sesame. It's like, hey, you do a little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of this. That's why when we make foods, we're adding all these things that are reducing blood pressure, reducing blood pressure, reducing blood sugar, reducing cholesterol. So it's not just like, oh, I just got to eat garlic, 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 for example, or I just got to eat turmeric, turmeric, or cinnamon, cinnamon, cinnamon. It's like, but once you start adding these things to your beverages, to your foods, your salads, your, your sandwiches, this is how over time the food becomes medicine. I think we get really hyper focused, unfortunately, to do one thing like this is a superfood. And, the, and they will even say on the, on the packages in the grocery store, superfoods, right? So, like, you'd say, I just only need to eat this and I don't need to do anything else. Here's cacao, it's a superfood. Uh, and then we don't do that. We actually eat a variety of things. And so, that I, I kind of want to make sure that people understand that it's good to do that. It's good to add more sesame. But what I would do is go back or get the book and then look at like, what else can I look at? What also just this is reminding me that I'll probably do is I'll probably do one of my last seg seg segments of the healing spices, I'll go through a summary of the diseases then, and I'll do it the reverse way. So I'll say like, here's blood pressure, here are the spices, here's blood sugar, here's the spice. So then people, because we're kind of more disease oriented, in, you know, in America, like we want to look at what's good for our symptoms. And instead of just learning about the spice, you want to learn it through the disease, fine by me, because the more of those things as you start adding, that makes your pantry, your medicine chest that you own, that you can control, and that doesn't have side effects. 
Thank you. So Mar says, where do you find sun-dried tomato powder? I get it at local spicery and he will be on the show tomorrow. And if you order through the link he provides, you get two free samples. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I like that idea. <laughs> I might have to do that. Nice. And Mar also says, can I schedule an appointment with you, Dr. Pai? Because I do feel tired. Yes, you can contact our office at 505-821-6300, or you can send us an email to wellness at Sanjevani, spelled S-A-N-J-E-V-A-N-I. Yep. And least, uh, we'll least, be glad to assist you. Yeah, and we'll have that in the show notes yeah. too. And Lisa says, is it the oil itself that brings out the health benefit and spices or the process of heating them? Uh, it's the process of heating them, but most of those things, the oil helps ex the extraction of that. It, you know, because a lot of these things, um, it's going to have a little bit of fat solubility of it. It's going to help better absorption of it. Now, we're not talking about a lot. So when, when I'm saying like, you know, I'm talking about like a teaspoon of oil is nothing considering the, the maximum health benefits that you get from cooking. So if you look at any, if you go to any world-class chef or any Asian restaurant, just make it simple of that. In the, now, you, they might put too much oil on the cooking shows that you see in America. So, uh, you know, but they put a little bit of oil and then we put the, the garlic and the onions and we cook it in a little bit. Or we put a little turmeric or coriander or cumin, you know, and ginger. This is, and we, we, we saute it for about 30 seconds to a minute. You know, even the black seed, the mustard seeds, right? We have to get it to where they actually start to pop. When they're popping, then they're ready. They're releasing all of those, those health benefits. Otherwise, you can eat them raw. They're just not going to get that stronger medicinal benefits. And we just kind of go back again to what traditionally they were cooking it with um, and how they cook it. So I think, I think the idea is that everybody was you know, um, anti-oil because of American diet with oil. But we have to look at what the rest, how much the rest of the world uses is not necessarily how much we use here. And I think that's the, the when we talk about you know, using oil in our diet, uh, Americans we use way too much. But then we also have the extreme where people who don't use any oil, they actually have other medical problems. And then when we do their testing, we can see that. I can have people when they come back with our super plant-based, no oil, then their omega-3s are super, super low. And their omega-9s are super, super low. And their DHA levels are super, super low. EPA levels are super, super low. So having more inflammation, more, you know, more, more, more cognitive issues, dryness issues, constipation issues, and all. And again, it's not the extreme that you got to eat tons of it, but the idea is restricting it out like that the data doesn't pan it. Now, doctors who promote that is because their patients who have their second or third stent or bypass, they have not been well adherent to any dietary advice so far. So why do they go no oil is because you can't tell, and this is me being opinionated, but why they do that for their patients also is because they are not capable, unfortunately, at their stage in life and, and the decisions they made to actually maybe make a healthier decision or they're in a place where they can't get healthier options when they go out to eat. So it's easier to go to a restaurant and say, don't put any oil, bake it for me, rather than, especially if you're going out, they're not going to be cooking in good oil. And it's usually, no matter how much you ask them, it's going to be usually greasier than it should be, right? So for that purpose, to say no oil for someone who's got really, really bad heart disease is a good thing because it's, it's, a, it's a happy medium because like they go say no oil, they'll probably still get some from the restaurant, but they're not just dousing in it, right? But the idea is that when we look at, again, healthy people and we look at the data, that's not really as, as supportive it is. Those people who had higher risk issues, their problem is that they're not eating a healthy diet to begin with. And that's part of just being more restrictive on avoiding the things that put them there where they, you know, to begin with. Well, I don't eat any oil and I, I eat very low fat, but I get my omega-3s tested every year and I can show them to you. I've had doctors on the show review them and they're like amazing. Right. So we would see that. And if, if it is great, if you are in an anti-inflammatory state, if your omega threes are great, your omega sixes are fine and you don't, and your mega and, and your Delta six desaturates shows that you convert and you're, you know, and your low saturated fat. Great power to you. If you still have dry skin, you still have constipation, you still have insomnia, you still have a little bit of Vata excess, or you have any other risk of any other kind of condition, then not necessarily perfect. So then we can modify that. But yeah, a lot of people don't think that they don't convert omega threes being plant-based, but when we test them, they do because most people do. So most people have the enzyme that's functional so they can eat flax, chia, hemp, walnuts and convert their EPA and DDHA. But when we test them and if they do come back where that enzyme and conversion is impaired, which is about 20% of my patients that come in, then an omega three from plants 
uh, is beneficial. They still need to eat the food for the protein and the fiber, but they still the, some of these people just don't convert the EPA and DHA. The industry, unfortunately, falsely pushed everybody, said nobody's converting from food, take an omega-3 supplement, and that was misinformation just to sell more product. Thank you. Uh, I hope you say your name right. Ravelin is saying that they live near you. And do you, where do you get your spice locally, Dr. Pai? And are there good sources near you? We have some spices actually in our store now that we started carrying. I'm going to be carrying more uh, afterwards. Uh, so if you come into our store, if you live nearby, you can swing on by. We don't have a lot of things, uh, but we have a few brands and a few companies that when you come in, you know, if we don't carry it, then you can look at them and you can buy them online or order directly from them. We try to pick the ones that are really commonly used just because patients like they want to start off on something that's really easy to put in a tea or put in something that they're commonly using. So they're not keeping it for a long period of time. But there is a few companies that we like. And we like to also make sure that, again, buying smaller, buying them in smaller packages if they're if they're in glass or tin. Um, and again, just making sure that you're getting a good quality uh, when you can get organic if it's available. And also buying smaller portions is key. Uh, and trying to avoid just super, 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 super cheap spices, which, you know, the internet's everywhere, Amazon's everywhere. And so say with the Annie, uh, uh, Star Anise, I didn't even know that there was a, a different form of it, but that was a big deal because FDA at one time was about 10 years ago was going to stop the, the importation and use of Star Anise because it, it became a big scare, not knowing that there was a different form of that. You know, a diff, like plants and foods always have, there's hundreds of mushrooms. Most mushrooms are good for you. There's a few mushrooms that can cause a mantadino poisoning that cause you can die from, right? And so we have to be careful when, you know, now everything is being sold on TikTok and, and the internet where you're getting a good quality. I like to look on some of those things as, as just bigger companies or companies that are just solely into spices. And, and it's not like, oh, it's a flash sale or being sold at a dollar store or a discount store because that might be more of the issues of contaminants or not finding traceability from farm to table. Yeah, thank you. Oh, you know what? There were so many questions in the chat. I forgot to ask you the ones that were previously submitted. So let me do that now. This one is from Gunther. Dr. Pai, in your December 2023 interview, I asked about spices that are good for eye vision, and you stated parsley since that was the one spice you had talked about in part nine. Have you discovered any other spices that you might be talking about in the future that can be used to maintain one's eye health? I'll come back on the follow-up on that because I'm going to go through all the diseases. So I'll, I'll put that together. Okay. So right. Gunther, hold on. Stay tuned <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to make a list of everything. So on the top of my head, I, I can't remember right now, but when I go through everything, I'll put them in categories. And so, uh, you know, and this will be like for vision and this will be for, um, you know, those other things, you know, so that I'll come back to that. Thank you so much. And let's see, there, there was a new question that just appeared. Um, now, now, just on a side, you know, so lutein, as we know, is really good for the eyes. That's a flower, right? Uh, but I'm just letting you know, like, where, where lutein is very helpful because lutein helps, you know, lutein, xanthine, zexanthine, you know, all these, you know, the, 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 some of those actually come from algaes, right? So there's, there's those things uh, uh, um, that are very, very important. Um, astaxanthins and all the stuff, these all come, those are for eye compounds. Now, those are not foods, it actually comes from an algae source. And there's quality issues and stuff like that. And we can always talk about that. But those have really strong data on helping vision and visual, visual uh, um, impairments. And then also just that it's not necessarily a, a food supplement is that we carry something called Revision, which is a, a vision peptide. And these are the peptides that are specifically for retinal health for patients that have uh, uh, things like uh, retinopathies and, and vision issues in the back of the eye. Uh, there's data that that's been very, very supportive. And people can usually help see, like even that have macular degeneration can see improve levels of reading on the eye chart by using that. That's that that's not necessarily like those that's that specific nutrients to the eye, but that's kind of scientifically uh, manufactured rather than just eating it from a food. Lutein comes from marigolds, and so when you think of just also an off of of eggs, which we don't recommend people eating. But the number one exporter of marigold flowers, like if you ever go to India, if you ever see, we have these wonderful yellow garlands and then we have it strung everywhere in the houses and on the temples and just for weddings and stuff like that. It's like the roses of India, right? We just use a lot. But in the southern part of India, there's mounds and mounds and mounds, like literally like three, four stories, mounds of marigolds on the southern half, uh, southern part of India where the ships dock. And the reason why they export that to the United States is because when they factory farm eggs here, which are terrible if you never want to understand how factory farming eggs are. But 
they feed those factory farm eggs, the chickens, the marigold in their feed because the marigold has that lutein, but not only has the lutein, it also has this yellow color. And that makes the yolk, which is un unhealthy, meaning the, the darkness is not so bright, it brightens it artificially. So people can open the eggs and they go here, oh, they look at the yellow oak, they, they, they think it's a, it's a better, richer egg, but now it's kind of an artificial way of making that egg look healthier or more nutritious, even though it's not. So, but now they're claiming now that those eggs have better nutrients for your eye vision because of the marigolds. So, it's, so this is how the food industry, there's a whole section, if you're interested in that, in my book, An Inflammation Nation, that talks about food trickery and uh, eggs is one of them and, and the marigolds is one of them, just like how we use astaxanthine also and, and how they can make a, 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 fa a factory farm fish look fresh. So a lot of people go to the store, they think, oh, the salmon looks pink and the, 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 the fish has a little pinker thing color it must be more fresh and it's actually uh, it's a carotenoid that we would take you know normally that comes from the algae but they actually get it from the offshore of the, uh, the off industry of the shrimp shells when they're taking the shrimp that shells then are ground they get the carotenoid that's really really high color astaxanthin which is super red it's like a colorant it's good for your vision but they give it to the factory farm fish to turn the flesh of the pink uh, of the gray fish to turn into pink and then people think it's fresh fish so anyways these are little things that people are using in the industry to fool people thinking the animal protein is, is um, healthy, but it's not. Thank you. This is from Rena. Dr. Pai, thank you for the great information on healing spices. Someone advised me that cinnamon and rosemary water on the scalp is good for ball spots. Do you agree? Cinnamon sticks and rosemary boiled in water a few minutes, allowed to cool, and then later sp spritzed on the scalp. I'm not sure about the cinnamon. I'd have to look at the study on cinnamon and scalp, but rosemary, yes. If you go back to my rosemary discussion, uh, it's uh, it's about 10 drops in an ounce of any kind of topical oil. I would use an organic coconut oil just because it has the most anti-inflammatory effects and it's nice and rich on the scalp, but you can use any other thing. And that has been shown to be very similar to um, uh, minoxidil 5%. It takes longer for the hair to grow but it smells better <laughs> and it doesn't cause the skin irritation that people can get with the inert ingredients with some of the minoxidil and some of the creams. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure that, yeah, there's, I'm not sure how cinnamon, I mean, probably has anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, I don't think it'd be harmful, but you can do it that way. I, I don't think there's any harm in that. Thank you. Um, this is from Gladys. Dr. Pai, is it okay and beneficial to use spices directly on the food, like soups, stews, sandwiches, drinks, as we do with salt and pepper, or do some spices need to be cooked with the food for better absorption or for any other reason? Both. So some foods, some spices, yes. When we heat it, we cook it, we activate the, 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 the phytochemicals in there. It just makes it more powerful and tastier. Uh, but you can also sprinkle, definitely. I'd rather have people use the spices than not use it, put it that way first. And then optimizing is like, well, if the recipes are calling you to cook with it, then cook with it. And if you can sprinkle it on just because you like the flavor or the taste in it or throw it on afterwards, that's, you're still going to get some health benefits. Any spice that you add or herb to your food is always going to be better than none. So I, always want, I don't want to always have this like strict like all or nothing phenomenon, which everybody kind of sometimes things like I can't do this unless I can't, I don't want to have any can'ts. I want I, no can do choo choos in my office. It's like you do it. And then can we do better or can we enhance it further or how we can make it taste better or how do we make it blend easier? Uh, that's sometimes with a cooking aspect. Uh, so it doesn't float at the top. It doesn't stick to the side or sometimes when we're cooking, there's a little bit of a, no, a nuance of how do we make certain things kind of also become more uniform in the food as well. But yeah, you can use both. So I, I'm really appreciative. I'm really glad that you are using it that way. And uh, um, part of it is just to explore, 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 explore. I like people that try things. Don't be so hardcore with the rules uh, of like putting it raw or cooking it. Try to see what you like. Um, and that's where you got to get the furthest benefits because it's the utilization of it and becoming familiar and comfortable with it is what makes your health better rather than saying, I didn't do it because I didn't have the heating element, right? I didn't do it because I didn't have these other spices to blend with it. Start using it. Yep. Thank you. Uh, on Instagram, uh, there's a question from Bev. Is there a typical shelf life when you buy a container of spices? That's a great question. So for each spice, it's quite, it's quite different. And in the book, Healing Spices, uh, it will then tell you per spice how to not only prepare it, but how to store it if you buy it. Because some things like the sun-dried tomato can last a very, very long time in glass once it's dried. And other things you know, may have several months. Some things have a very few weeks, particularly if it's fresh. 
uh, like an herb. And so there's ways even in the book, which is nice, which is I'll tell you even how to dry the herbs. So say if you grow certain things in your yard or a little bit of a plant or a little bit of a pot and you have it, you're like, well, I can't eat all of this every one time. I'm just going to pick it. Then it's, I'll tell you like how you dry it, how to prepare it, then how you can then keep it yourself. So you're not just throwing it away and saying, oh, I only used it for that two weeks of season when it was blooming. And then I was done with this. Like, no, you, how you can keep it for the rest of the year. So each spice is somewhat different. Now, usually in general, when you buy things though, I mean, it's just just several months, no more than a year for, in general for most things. And again, that's going to be smaller containers, glass, tin, you know, airtight. If you buy things that are in plastic, which they come in the stores, right? Sometimes you're buying a little bit more bulk of the herbs. I always transfer it to glass. Okay. Then, then the whole reason is because you want to keep and retain. Also, when you start looking at herbs and when you usually crush an herb, you know, even you can put in your hand and you crush it. I always like to, uh, going back to the question that the ladies were saying, let me sprinkle it. So when you sprinkle herbs and it's safe, it's already dried. What I always tell people to do is also kind of grind it a little bit more. If you grind it a little bit more and you have that smell, then there's still oils from the herbs, then you're still getting the medicinal benefits. If you have something that's been in your shelf for a long time and you go, gosh, I grind it, smell it, I don't really smell anything. You know, it just kind of smells plain and doesn't smell like the, re the oregano doesn't smell, have that nice oregano smell then you're already, it's already dried. It's already lo lost most of its vol volatility and its medical benefits. So then it's not worth it anymore. So, and the book will cover like what to, what to watch for, what to smell for, what to see in the herb in terms of how it may change a color, how it may change a consistency or smell or even in use. And then that will guide you on that. But again, I always like people to, to buy smaller, use it and buy smaller rather than going to the big box store and saying, Hey, I got a big old, you know, half pound of something for cheap. It's usually not worth it. It's already old by the time you get it. And usually that's more for just for the smell rather than for the health quality. Thank you. And would you mind holding up your book again? Cause Mary's asking if your book has star anise on the cover. No, the book that has star anise is the healing spices. That's the one. That's what she yeah. asked. Yeah, yeah. And that's Dr. Agarwal's book. That's not my book. Okay. He's Thank a colleague you. of mine who wrote the book. Dr. Ogwal was a, uh, was a, is a big researcher. He used to be at MD Anderson, and he was in the, in the Division of Natural Therapeutics and Cancer uh, Products. His research, interesting, has developed three or four big immunotherapy drugs in the, you know, so like from the industry, the drug industry, like he's super famous because he's, uh, you know, you go in and get an infusion of a certain drug. He developed, designed the pathways. He figured out what kind of things can do that. But it's through the natural products because they used to have a hundred postdocs there. This is way back when MD Anderson was really progressive. Now it's all different. All, there's, they got rid of all these people a long time ago. Um, but they, they published hundreds and hundreds of studies and articles using natural therapies because science is science. Like you shouldn't be biased of where it's coming from or, or what language or what continent we want to look. We're all looking at how do we lower cholesterol in a patient safely? How do we lower blood sugar? How can we improve cancer or lower the risk of cancer growth or even kill cancer cells or, you know, help some kind of memory problem. Right. And so the idea is that we shouldn't be shy because we have to look at all those people in these places around the world who might be doing better on some level. Is there something related to their environment, lifestyle, and diet? These are the epigenetics. And usually that's what leads us to do this research. So that's, that's, that's why we're using food as medicine. And so that's, that, that's the goal for all of these things is to try to incorporate food as medicine and, and learn how you can be more in control of what you're taking. Um, again, we always give targeted supplements when we need to for specific reasons. And most people know who come see me, they'll say like, that's from this plant or that's, yeah, and that's like a super concentrate. It's like eating pounds and pounds of that. We're doing that because we're trying to reverse a disease or we're already in a crisis mode or we need to get something under control safely and effectively without the side effects. But eating these things throughout the day and throughout your, your week and throughout the year, throughout your life, that just helps turn down and, you know, all the risk factors and turn up all the positive epigenetics. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Here's a question. Okay, which test do you recommend to test for adequate levels of all minerals and vitamins as you've been discussing? So we, so, so we do, so I did a lecture just recently on the real truth about health just on Saturday. And one of the tests that we look at is a nutrition test that we do. It's a urine test and it will test then all the antioxidants, A, C, E, CoQ10, glutathione, um, all your B vitamins, one through 12. The challenges with the B vitamins is that most people go see their primary and they just check B12 and folic acid. But what about B1, B2, B3, B6, B7? Um, and then we look at minerals like magnesium, zinc, molybdenum, molybdenum, omega-3, 6, 7s, 9s, our conversion, 
all your amino acids, uh, heavy metal toxicities, like the things that are in environment, uh, and also toxic nutrients. A lot of people are taking too much nutrients of certain things like copper. Everybody's taking copper supplements now. For some reason, they're marketing it like crazy, and yet too much copper becomes a pro-inflammatory risk, uh, and it also can increase risk of cancer uh, recurrence, and especially breast cancer patients, what the research shows. So we can we evaluate that. But that's how when I see a patient, then we, we, you know, we put it to the test. You know, like Grieger always says, put it to the test, right? So put it to the test. Like, and it's not saying that anybody's doing anything wrong, but we're not robots. Again, if we all ate the same food and we all took the same supplements and the same medications or whatever, our test would be completely unique because that's, we are unique people. You know, we're bio individually different, even though we have similar things. And so this is key because then you can know, like, what do you specifically need to eat more of? or what you might need a supplement if you were so deficient in, rather than just taking, you know, a lot of people like, I just take tons of supplements, not targeted, or I take none, not targeted, right? Or I think I'm healthy because I'm eating this much, you know, fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, seeds, and nuts. Great, great. I'm eating all my G-bombs. Great, great, great. Now, how well are you? Well, let's test it. If you're all great, keep up with it. If something's behind, just like we do with regular medicine, we need to measure like what your blood pressure is. If your blood pressure is great, don't need to worry about it anymore. If your cholesterol is great, don't need to worry about it. But if there's still an imbalance, we need to look at what else do we need to do rather than just treating the symptoms. Why don't we look at things that can help improve the physical function, which is from food. The simplest, easiest thing that most people should enjoy is eating. And in America now is having a phobia with food. Maybe, you know, we're having obesity problems. We're having, we're giving, they're giving drugs like crazy about, you know, that are stopping people from eating, causing all sorts of microbiome and, 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 and cognitive and mood issues and, and depression and, and psychiatric problems like, like suicide. Um, so we have to look at like how to make food fun and food flavorful rather than being food phobic. I love that food phobic. Okay. Um, somebody's asking me where I get my omega threes from, but I get it from greens. You can get omega three from greens because I'm have... competing omega sixes in my diet. Yeah, but you will still have omega sixes in your test. So we're not zero omega sixes, right? We still get we still get omega sixes from grains, for example. But it's just too much omega sixes, and that's why there's a healthy balance between threes and sixes. When we're plant based, we're and or you're eating healthy, you're always going to have a higher level of omega threes and omega sixes. But in the standard American diet, it's almost it's super reverse. It's like in some places in America, it's multiple folds above. So people who live in the South, and they're having a lot of fried, 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 even fried green tomatoes, for example, with the deep fried Twinkie and all stuff, they can have a multiple fold, like 16 to, to one, 16 more omega-6 to one omega-3. But yeah, flax, chia, hemp seed, wal walnuts um, um, are great um, sources of, of omega-3s from the diet. Thank you. And here's a question. I, uh, from Karen, I love tomatoes, but I've noticed that they and the other nightshade cousins don't like me. Do sun-dried tomatoes have even more of the in inflammatory properties than the tomato themselves? It might because it's a hyper concentrate, right? So if you're sensitive to, and that's what we would test with our, if you became a client, for example, is that you can have an immediate or delayed reaction to tomato. So as much as I just said how great tomato is, tomato might not be great for you, right? As much as even the spices, right? Like, you know, oh, there's black pepper. Oh, there's ginger. Okay, there's garlic. And yes, it's great for everybody. The studies are fantastic. Millions of people take it. But for each person, your body's unique. And it can say, even to plant food, even to a seed, to a nut, a legume, or a fruit, or a vegetable, not always just animal proteins are bad. Yes, they're pro-inflammatory. We should be eating those. But you can have a problem with tomato. And it could be something that you eat within an hour, triggering a response, or something that you eat the tomato in a few hours up to four days later. It's called a delayed response that you can have for tomato. You can also have a problem where it's now and later. And with all of these sensitivities, it's based on two factors how much and how often. So you might say, well, I just had a little tomato salad, may not cause much of an issue. You might say, hey, I went to an Italian restaurant or and I had a, a bowl of marana. That's just a lot more concentration of that tomato. So that's a higher level of inflammation if you have a sensitivity, either immediate or delayed. Or someone like me, like, well, I'm having a little bit of this every day. That could be contributing to some of your inflammatory conditions or symptoms. If you have any condition that has the word itis, arthritis, bronchitis, gastritis, dermatitis, esophagitis, bronchitis, sinusitis, vaginitis, you know, whatever kind of itis you have, there's 200 of them. You can read my book, but that's what we have to look at. What is still coming in? Even in a plant-based person, they're still going to have sensitivities to something that they're still eating if they're still having inflammatory 
symptoms or conditions. And so that, that's where we want to individualize it because we can't just tell people to eat more of something, especially say tomatoes, which I said, it's really, really great for you. And yet, you know, you then might hyper concentrate something that you're allergic to into a, into a sun dried tomato and eat that and have more of a negative response. So that's where to answer your question, yes, hyper concentrated foods do usually can have more of that problem for the patient who may have a sensitivity. Juicing is definitely more because we're just like, so someone has a problem with carrots on my test, on the test that they take, and then they do a carrot juice. That's just like eight carrots being, you know, uh, juiced into a cup or apples or any kind of fruit. That's just a hyper concentration. So it's the amount, how much you take and how often is what will trigger that response. So just because someone has it doesn't mean that every time they eat it, they're going to have a problem. It's just the stacking effects of that how much of these things, how often, and some meals we're having three or four or five different things like in a salad or in a pizza or some kind of, you know, a taco that may have multiple toppings. And if someone has a few, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, that's what tips the, the levy point and it causes some symptoms. Thanks. And here's an interesting question. So Karen says, what is it in the nightshades that for people that have an, an inflammatory response, like pain in their joints, what is it in nightshades that cause it specifically? I love that question. So it, it is a good question, but here's the interesting thing is that we don't, I don't doing this for 25 years. We don't find the nightshade class, the problem we find a single food or a f- one or two foods that might be in the class, but it's not a class effect. So what happens is a lot, and, and this is my opinion. Okay. So there's a lot of people who probably disagree with it, but since I do food testing and that's my thing, I've been doing this for 25 years and, you know, everybody comes in and say, oh, well, I can't have eggplant. I can't have tomatoes. I can't have potatoes. I can't have you know, the nightshades, blah, 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 cause my joints to flare. But what the, the truth of the matter is that they can definitely have a strong reaction to a single food in that family or class. And then the story gets bigger and bigger because as they would tell the doctor, like, oh, I had tomatoes and I flared, they might have just a tomato sensitivity, but then the doctors don't know anything about nutrition. So when someone comes and say, hey, I have joint problems, what should I avoid? Then that list got longer and longer and then became like became this class, but not everybody that we have, because when we test those patients who come in, they, a lot of them, I would say almost all of them do not have, they may have one in that class or maybe two, but they don't have every single nightshade. So the idea is that the list just becomes longer just because we classify it together. Kind of we're kind of grouping them, you know, uh, accordingly on one level. And, you know, just like we find people that come back, you know, on our testing, I can't have melon. It's like, oh, no, you can't have cantaloupe, but you can have watermelon. Oh, I didn't know that because I just ate melon. Yeah, I ate one melon. So I blame all melon, right? I have a fruit. I have berry. And I had a problem with blueberries. So then they think strawberry and raspberries. No, they're different. We have someone the other day that came in with, with beans. Right. So you can have pinto bean or black bean, but she's like, what about what about cannelli beans or, or kidney beans or white beans? They're slightly different. So you can. So but then, you know, she's like, I can't eat any beans because they bother me. And I tested her. I was like, no, you have a kidney, you have a black bean and a pinto bean problem. So here in New Mexico, we eat tons of black beans and pinto beans, almost a dollar of Mexican food. That's a problem. So then she, the fear is like, I can't have any beans. Right. But we want to look at then what is a specific food that you can have and then also how to retrain your body. That's the other thing that we're specializing in that most people don't. It's not just an avoidance. Don't eat this forever. It's how do you then bring it back scientifically, systematically, that you can retrain your immune system to become tolerant because you still want those phytonutrients. You still want the antioxidants, still want the fiber, still want the protein from those foods and the taste that we're missing. Sometimes like that's my favorite or that's I can't have a taco without that or I can't have a sandwich without that or a pasta without that. So. That's one thing that's really important about food sensitivities. It's not a forever, you can never eat this. It's, it's identifying what your trigger is and then fixing other things like if there's any gut microbiome problems, which most people do have, and then they can improve their tolerance and reintroduce them back that food. Great. Well, this was great, Dr. Pai. If you want to show your book one more time, people keep asking about sure. it. So an inflammation nation, again, it's on Amazon, but you can order it from our office, sanjevni.net or sanjevni store, actually sanjevni store.com, S-A-N-J-E-V-A-N-I store, S-T-O-R.com. And I'll send, I'll sign up a personal copy for you. Uh, or you can get on Audible. Those people, it's actually read by a fantastic guy who does voice. Um, it's really great. It's not my voice, by the way. So it won't sound like Mickey Mouse is talking to you. That's how I think my voice is. But, um, anyways, it's a great, it's a great read. It's about 14 hours uh, on the audible. So if you want to like sit and read exercise or driving to work and you want to learn about things, um, also you can see my, our YouTube channel. We have tons of, uh, interviews and, and again, sign up to our newsletter, sendgemini.net or sendgeministore.com for our podcast. that will be coming out. We're going to do deep dive into all sorts of topics and researchers and doctors. And also we're going to move into to also like uh, legal aspects of um, food industry, 
what you can do for like as activism for like making sure environmental aspects because now, now we're branching out your health is just more than what you're putting in your mouth it's how the people who are growing it is what is the local laws or federal laws that you should be contacting your uh representative that you may not know that is being passed in the night uh, as we'd say that you should be aware of and so we're going to kind of expand you know when we say take back your health it's not just going to be hey you eat plant-based we're going to go further so that we can enlighten and empower you on how to actually take a proactive uh, stance not only to what you bring in your kitchen but how your community might be uh being affected as well and also as a country being affected as well this was great thank you so much dr pie all right thank you blessings everyone best of health and i'll talk to you soon See you next month. And thanks to all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time for vinegar and spice and everything nice, where we will show you where you can get the sun-dried tomato powder, as well as introducing a brand new spice blend. And Nick will be talking about pickles from around the world or pickled vegetables from around the world. And Thomas will be making a, a teriyaki eggplant, pineapple unfried rice, and a teriyaki tahini tofu. Take Yummy. care, everyone. Yeah, it's good stuff. Thanks for